Next, we're going to talk about the different types of advocacy that you can be involved in. And then I want to discuss more specific legislative information um, and talk about who your legislative representatives are and how to find out more information about them if you don't already know that. Um, we're then going to talk about examples of a coalition, who you might want to find out more about information on it, on your advocacy journey, um, if you want more of like a broad general spectrum, um, and how collaboration is really really the key to advocacy. Collaboration and teamwork is really what we're we're going and striving for. Um, next, we're going to discuss local advocacy. So some specific examples of how you can advocate for different issues in your own community or in your own neighborhood and how individual advocates like yourself are actually going to help us do our work at Save the Dunes successfully. Um, we're going to talk also about lobbying in D.C. during Great Lakes Day, of course, as Em was talking about. And then we're going to talk about how one of you who was watching today could actually join us um, on our lobbying team uh, next year in D.C. during Great Lakes Day. Um, and last but not least, we're going to talk about teamwork and how working together is always important and necessary in any big advocacy effort. Okay, so I just want to start at the very beginning of just what exactly is advocacy? I think it's kind of like one of those words that we say a lot, but maybe we need to like define it to make sure we're all on the same page. So what is advocacy in a general sense? So advocacy is the act or process of supporting any cause or any proposal. Um, now at Save the Dunes, we focus specifically on environmental advocacy. Uh, so that's supporting uh, any type of cause around the environmental spectrum. But I do want to stress that there are other types of advocacy that you can be interested in or passionate about and that environmental advocacy is just one of the many types of advocacy under the general advocacy umbrella. Um, so when I say environmental advocacy, what exactly do I mean by that? Um, well, environmental advocacy means to present information on an ecological uh, on ecological issues as a way to encourage the audience to adopt more environmentally sensitive practices. Um, and as, as you can see by that definition, environmental advocacy is a very broad issue um, that can contain many number of different efforts or movements in it. So we're going to kind of talk about some more specifics later on. So who exactly can be an advocate? I get that question a lot. So are there specific qualifications that you need to be an advocate um, for something? And the answer to that is absolutely not, 100% not. Anybody can be an advocate. Age is not a barrier. Um, young people can and absolutely have the capacity to be advocates for issues that they believe in. I know that a lot of people, you know, have an idea in their mind of like, you know, you need a lot of degrees or you need to be a certain age and have a lot of experience, but that's absolutely not correct. Young people are, one of the best types of advocates because their their passion and their their capacity to learn new things is really amazing. Um, and so some amazing environmental adv advocates, I'm just going to give some examples such as like Greta Turnberg, have, have, like everyone's usually heard of her. She's been so inspiring at such a young age. And that really shows you that age is just a number. It doesn't mean that you cannot be an advocate at, at that at such a young age. Um, so um, advocacy does not need any prior professional or personal experience, as I said, but I would say that passion is required for sure. Um, if you're interested or passionate about an issue that really uh, makes or drives an advocacy movement, and that passion really just acts as a snowball um, and that will show other advocates that are around you or interested in the same things to feed off of that energy and that passion and advocate more effectively as well. And so it's never too early or too late to be an advocate or to get into advocacy. Um, there is no age limit uh, that goes for when you're senior as well as if there's advocates of every age group uh, remember that your age is never a deterrent from any good advocacy work so i want to say give a specific example of when a successful advocacy effort actually affected all of us in northwest indiana so advocacy saved the indiana dunes uh, supporters such as our founder of save the dunes dorothy buell uh, rallied public support and was instrumental in the uh, effort to establish a, you know, Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, which is now, of course, a national park in 2019 um, and in the Indiana Dunes region. And without her effort and the effort of many, many others like her, uh, these the this area would not be protected. Um, this likely that there would not be a national park here today or rather a national lakeshore before it was it became a national park. Um, and so that's really, really important to understand that this area, this region that we know and we love is really a result of Dorothy Buell and a lot of other advocates like her. 
So I just want to go a little bit into who Dorothy Buell was um, and how did she advocate for the Indiana Dunes. Um, so she was a resident of Ogden Dunes and she really loved the be beautiful Duneland region and wanted to protect it from the growing industry development in the Lake Michigan shoreline area. She really understood that this is a growing uh, issue and so she wanted to do something about that. So what she did is she rallied public support and was instrumental in the battle to establish a natural national lakeshore, which is now our national park in the Indiana Dunes region. Um, so she and a group of women established uh, the Save the Dunes Council, where she courageously led citizens to preserve the remaining unprotected habitat in the Dunlin region from being developed by industry. And I want to highlight that her passion was one of the most important factors in her advocacy work um, and in her, in her advocacy story. And although she was extremely successful in her efforts, she was not a scientist or an expert about the Indiana Dunes, but she understood how important it was and how precious the Dunlin area was and her passion and her drive to save the dunes was why she was so successful and she was able to do that and save the Indiana Dune region for future generations. So how can you advocate and what types of advocacy can you be involved in? So there's several types as we were talking about, but I want to highlight four specifically. So you could use letters, voting, speeches, or phone calls. Uh, to advocate. So when we talk about using letters, what do we mean that, by that? So that means anything from submitting public comment letters during a permit renewal period, uh, writing or emailing a letter to your representatives, telling them your stance or your opinion on a certain issue or topic. Uh, speaking out could be another way you could advocate. So making sure that your voice is heard at public meetings or meetings directly with representatives in their open sessions. Uh, voting is another great way to be an advocate. So uh, making sure that your political voice is, as a constituent of that region is heard. Uh, phone calls to your representative is also a great way to get involved. Um, to express your opinion on a specific bill or topic that you're passionate about. So these are just many of the, there's a lot of other ways that you could be an advocate, but these are just four specific ways about how you can be an advocate. So if you're an advocate or you want to be an advocate, where exactly should you start? Um, so the first thing I would suggest is to stay really well informed of current events. Staying well informed of current events or issues can be an excellent way to spark your interest. Um, in a specific issue or topic in the future. So while you're staying informed, it's also important to do the research um, and around the advocacy topic, whichever one it is that inspires you. <laughs> so making sure that when you do have an opportunity to talk to your legislators or others, that you're able to advocate with specific research points. Um, that's really, really crucial. Uh, when legislators see that and understand that an advocate is coming to them and they're well-researched and, and thought out points about a sp specific topic or specific stance on their issue, um, they're more likely to seriously consider your points or your voice and opinion more um, if, that, if that opinion is researched and, and well thought out. Um, in a more local aspect, you could start in your advocacy journey by writing a letter to your editor of a local newspaper. Uh, by writing an opinion piece, it can really strengthen the impression of widespread support for your issue. If others are able to read your opinions in a local paper and they are also passionate about the same issue, they it will also maybe spark others to join the same cause or the issue that you're interested in. Um, finally, you could also consider attending your own local town hall meetings, uh, which will allow you not only to engage uh, with your lawmakers directly, but it will also raise awareness of key environmental issues in your community and also reach a larger audience and possibly gain local support for the issue that you're advocating for. So the next few slides, we're going to discuss that topic a little bit further. So here's some examples of how you could advocate today in some of the local issues that are affecting us in Northwest Indiana. Um, I only picked three. There's a lot of other ones out there, but um, these are definitely things that you can uh, get involved in if this is something that you're interested in today. So uh, you could, for instance, submit a comment letter on the new EPA rule for ballast water to protect the Great Lakes from incidental discharges from vessels. Um, if you're interested in, you know, stopping invasive species, uh, this one specifically is about the invasive zebra mussels in the Indiana Dunes region. And so for this specific rule, the public comment period ends on December the 18th. Um, and another topic you might want to be an advocate for is wetland protections at the state level. Um, due to the recent Supreme Court case, 
um, SACA versus EPA. It's now really up to the states um, to protect these now vulnerable wetlands that for the first time will not be protected by federal regulations. So uh, the state session for Indiana starts in uh, January for 2024. So if this is a topic that is of interest to you, this is a great time to kind of meet your state representatives uh, and your state senators and make sure that they understand how important wetland protection is to you, and especially in the Northwest Indiana region, which is one of the most ecologically biodiverse areas in the entire country. Um, another bill that is being discussed in Congress is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which will conserve and restore habitat that wildlife depends on in every state. And it ensures that fish and wildlife managers have the resources that they need to implement the proactive conservation projects um, that helps them to prevent species from becoming endangered in the first place. So like I said, these are just three main examples that of how others could be an advocate today in the Northwest Indiana region, um, but there are many, many others. So we're gonna go a little bit more to specifics now about how uh, you could be an advocate. So staying informed. So first staying informed about current events that affect both you and others in your community and the decisions uh, to those events uh, by elected representatives in your area might help you create a game plan when you're talking to them. So I would like to emphasize that although current events may not have a direct impact on your specific issue that you're advocating for, it might be related um, and even be as important to your legislators. So I've been in several lobby meetings where we've had this tab to discuss important current issues or events in conjunction with our advocacy agenda. And leg legislators really appreciate that and like that because it shows how the advocate is paying attention and should be listened to because they're showing event, uh, interest in their topic um, as well as like current events. So staying informed um, allows you to be better equipped when you're having these conversations with other audiences that you're trying to reach. So for example, when you're trying to speak out in your own community to get other supporters, uh, it's being well informed gives you the tools that you need to have deeper conversations with your audience. It also uh, under it keeps them informed and makes them kind of want to listen to you more uh, because you have a well thought out response. So research, of course, research is so important when you're uh, trying to do your advocacy work. Uh, research and advocacy effort is important because it adds substance to your movement, allows you to give specific facts and statistics and add that with your passion for, uh, add that with your passion for the issue. So it can, and many times show you what the best path is to take um, that will be when you're advocating. And through research, you can find other avenues or paths that you didn't think about before um, or approach or tackling, uh, or tackling an issue that you are passionate about. So it could also provide you with anecdotes or other examples to use while discussing this topic with your audience, which will make it easier for them to understand uh, what exactly you believe and what you're advocating for and why. So research is really, really, really important. Next, writing to an editor. So uh, what do we mean by writing a letter to the editor? So when you're writing a letter to them, you have the opportunity to, to tell others in your uh, community how you feel about an issue or an idea or inform others of a certain issue and create traction in that way. So it's a great way to increase awareness to others who may feel the same way about the issue in your own community and could create a group of advocates to help strengthen that specific movement. Um, a series of letters to the editor could also stimulate public interest and media coverage. So I've seen different advocacy efforts start as an opinion piece in a paper and then later grow from that and later be featured you know, in a media uh, coverage or, or uh, reach a bigger audience. So this is always like the starting point that can always lead to others joining your cause. So next, attending a town hall meeting. So attending a town hall meeting is a great way to be an advocate as well. Um, it's a way that, you, you know, if you want to advocate for your issue, the best way to do so is to meet with your representatives directly face to face, for sure. If that's not possible, virtual options, of course, are more uh, available and more common as well today. Uh, town halls act as a place uh, that an opportunity to participate in the democratic process, which is great. Um, it's important and is a way to express your opinion as a resident of that town 
um, and as a constituent, so that's fantastic. Um, it's also a great way to connect your policy issues to the personal effect. So when you go and you speak to your representatives, you might have an opportunity to connect with them on a personal level, which will be very similar to the, may be very similar rather to the representative's own story, their own personal story, um, and create a more sustainable impact on your audience and making sure that they seriously consider your proposal. So when you have that personal connection, that's really, really important when you're talking to your, uh, to your legislators. Leaders. They really love that, and they're able to connect you on a more human level. So next, we're going to talk about federal advocacy specifically and who exactly the Indiana federal representatives are um, in our state and a little bit about how the legislative process of uh, making a law. So this is a basic overview of the legislative process. Um, so I don't want to go over the entire process in detail. I know it's very complicated and detailed, so we don't want to spend too much time on it. But do you think it's important to just be a little generally familiar um, if you're going to be an advocate with the fact that there is a very long and complicated process before public law is actually enforced? So we start with the introduction and the referral to bills, and then there's a committee consideration of the bill, and then a more administrative process where if they decide to move forward, they're going to collaborate on their calendars and scheduling times. And it goes through both the House and the Senate with a joint resolution eventually. And the president acts on to acts to either approve or veto the bill. And if it passes all of those steps successfully, it becomes public law. So then it's actually going to be enforced. Um, so the reason I want to highlight this is to show that as an advocate, it's always better to express your opinion to your legislators um, in the beginning stages of the process uh, to get your voice and opinion expressed when your representative is at a time when they might have more flexibility to change or, or act on any information from you or other constituents who are concerned about a bill or an issue in a time matter. So always getting involved earlier, uh, talking to your legislators earlier is always better um, because they might be able to, to do something about that. So who exactly are our uh, Indiana congressional representatives in the Senate? So um, in our state uh, of Indiana, there are both Todd Young and Mike Braun. So they have their own websites uh, and they both have, you know, information about their issues that they're um, interested in and the different topics that they focus on. Um, and, you know, when you go to their websites, you're able to see exactly what each legislator is working on. Um, and it's very useful information if you plan to, you know, lobby or talk to them or, or contact them. Um, there's also a lot of these legislators or um, representatives also have like a monthly or weekly newsletter that they do send out to, um, to you know, their constituents um, if you subscribe to them. So if that's something that you would like to do as well, just subscribing to their e-newsletter might be a great way to to get informed about what, what your representatives are interested in or what they're doing um, currently. So now we're going to talk about the federal representatives. So um, if you live in Indiana, what ex who exactly are your federal uh, congressional representatives? And uh, so the uh, for us at Save the Dunes, um, our offices are in Michigan City and our representative is Frank Morvan. Um, so we communicate a lot with his office. Um, you might be in another district. And so it's important to know who your representative is uh, to make sure that you contact the correct representative. Um, and that in a later slide, we're going to go over exactly how to find out who your state and federal representatives are. There's a um, Indiana General Assembly website. And if you put in your um, information, it'll show you exactly who your state and your federal representatives are. So it's great. So now I'm going to switch over to state representatives. Um, so for state representatives, you can find them by going on the Indiana General Assembly website, as you, as I said, by putting in your address, and it basically will auto-populate with your entire list of both state and federal representatives and also their contact info. So for example, if we put in the Save the Dunes office uh, address and we click on Frank Mervan's search result, it'll show his office phone number, um, the state senator in our case, which is what Ronnie Pohl, um, and our state uh, representative, which is Pat Boy. So making sure to, you're talking to your representatives that represent you specifically as a constituent is important if a state advocacy issue is something that you want to be involved in, such as state wetlands protections, as we discussed before. So just making sure that you're contacting the correct representative that represents you um, is really, really important. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Indiana state legislature and how those bills are passed. So it's, once again, a very complicated process um, at the state level as well. But I just want to highlight two of the different stages in the bill making process. So the first one is that each bill presented by a legislature is first read in the House it originated from. At that point, either the Speaker of the House of the President Pro, uh, pro of the Senate refers the bill to the committee. Um, at a later point, citizens can attend and testify at the committee hearing on a specific bill being discussed, and committee chairs can decide if a committee hearing is held. But I just want to emphasize that individuals at this point can use this as a platform to advocate and make sure that your voice is heard um, about a certain issue. And if there's any concerns or comments that you have about um, a bill, and make sure that it's relayed to your legislators at that certain point. So I'm just gonna talk about some tips about when you're gonna to speak to legislators, things you might wanna just keep in mind. Um, so uh, when you're talking to your legislators, just keep in mind that they want to answer why, you want to answer rather why you are there and what group you're a part of. So the legislators and their staff are quite busy, You know, they have a lot of things to do and they speak to a lot of different groups and constituents. So making sure that they understand right away exactly why you're there, who you are, what group you represent, um, things like that is very, very essential. Uh, making sure that you have a clear and concise message um, when you talk to them, that you don't waste both your time and their time with any unclear points or making sure that you have a game plan or basic outline in your mind when you're talking to them is really, really important. Um, and it's a great first step. So when you talk to them next, you might want to consider finding out what your legislator's position on a specific issue is um, that might be concerning to you before you talk to them. So being prepared and doing the research as we discussed in the previous slides is really important. Um, always, it's always a great place to start so that the legislators know that you know you did your homework and you understand that it's important and you're interested in their agenda as well. Um, making sure that you know what they're interested in and what they care about is fantastic. It, it's always going to make them think about you and remember your conversation after, after your meeting. Um, another good idea is to bring a fact sheet for the legislators to look at. Uh, if you bring, bring a specific fact sheet with some key research points, it'll really help them understand the details about your issue and will provide them with some more specific information that they can look over later if they're really interested in it. Um, it's always a great, great idea to have just, just a general like one page or fact sheet um, that they can look over after your meeting. So if you de decide to write to your legislator, what exactly do you need to keep in mind? So once again, being brief and to the point is really essential. Um, the legislators and the staff members are all, like I said, very busy. They get a lot of emails and phone calls every single day. So keeping it on topic is really, really helpful to them. Um, understanding who you are and how you and the others will be affected is crucial. Um, being clear about what you want them to do is also essential to make your point come across. So naming the issue and specifically saying what you want the policymaker to do um, is also very important because the legislators will have so many other bills or so many other issues that they're focused on. So making sure you know exactly which one you're concentrating on is necessary to have a really productive conversation with them. Um, and then finally, making sure that the legislator knows exactly how you can be reached for further information or clarification on the issue is a really good idea. Um, oftentimes, you'll have a lot uh, more information or sometimes um, you're an expert on a topic. So making sure that they know exactly how and where to get information about the issue is a really good idea for if you want to have follow up meetings with them or follow up conversations with that legislator. So when you're emailing your legislator, what exactly should you focus on? So this is going to be very similar to actually writing them a letter, um, especially making sure that your email is not extremely long, but rather saying to the point and keeping it short, um, making sure that you put your name and possibly the organization or the group um, in the subject line, um, as it will help your legislators know who is contacting them. In your email, uh, it's also important to make sure that you identify yourself as a constituent, um, if possible, which will make the legislator understand, okay, your voice is important and that they represent you. So they're going to probably understand or, or pay attention more to your email than somebody maybe who isn't uh, a constituent or not in their district. Um, don't be afraid to share your personal story. As I said, um, those personal stories are really what makes it so different from just, you know, putting a bunch of numbers or, or specific details in. That personal story allows you to connect with your representative. Uh, legislators get a lot of emails every day, so making sure that your email is memorable and stands out to them is important. 
So if you're going to call your representatives, what are some good tips? Um, so if you're going to call them, it's really good idea to honestly have a pre-written script before you start the call to make sure you have a basic outline and know exactly what your points are that you want to express in the call. Uh, many times you might not uh, be able to get through to anyone. So having a specific, like voicemail draft, just in case you don't get anyone and you have to go to voicemail is a great idea. Just to tell, uh, when you tell the legislative office who you are, why you're concerned about a specific issue, um, et cetera. So if you're able to get through to the offices, however, you know, keep in mind that you are most likely going to be talking to their legislative staff members who are later gonna relay that information to the legislator. So giving them clear points um, and possibly discussing after the call is a good idea. You know, just making sure that you're as clear and succinct um, about your issue or topic as possible. So why exactly will legislators even listen to you? Like, why would they care what any of us have to say? Um, there's several different reasons why, and one of the most important reasons um, being is being that you are gonna be a constituent probably of theirs and they actually represent you. So it's actually their job to know what you want and need support in. Um, they would not be where they are without their constituents. Um, those are the people who vote for them, right? So they need helpful and valuable feedback from the people that they're representing. Um, next is information where you have ability to provide the legislators with good, reliable, well-researched information that's really important to them that they, in some cases, might not have knowledge of previously. So being able to rely on research information can really help your case um, and make the legislators understand that your voice is reliable. Um, knowledge is also very important to them. And once again, when I say knowledge, I don't mean like you have to be an expert in um, a topic or know everything about the specifics of an issue that you're advocating in. But just having a basic understanding about what is being discussed or what your topic is, is enough. Um, in addition, you could bring a team of experts with you um, to explain or discuss the details of the information that is more specific, if that's better for you. Um, having an advocacy group with different diverse voices is always a plus. It's always a really great idea when you're talking to the legislators. Um, next is comments. So your comments of, are more likely a representative of a base or politically active citizens. So the fact that you are, as an advocate, are going through the steps of doing the research and reaching out to your, uh, your representatives or your legislators is a great first step. And that means that you are exercising your rights as a political constituent, which is fantastic. So even if you have no knowledge of other groups who share your stance, it's still a good thing to keep in mind that you're most likely not the only person who cares about your topic or advocating on your issue. Um, and then next, of course, is passion. Um, passion is absolutely necessary to being an advocate. So in a previous slide, we would discuss that no prior knowledge or experience is necessary to be an advocate, but I would argue that passion is absolutely necessary to um, being an advocate, and especially when you're talking to these uh, legislators. If they understand that the person that they're talking to is not that passionate about the topic um, that they're talking about, then they're more likely to either tune it out completely or in your meeting, not as, your meeting won't be as memorable to them. Um, and they won't really focus on the topic or issue that you're advocating for. So passion is also really contagious. Um, I feel like, you know, if they see that you're passionate about the subject that um, you're interested in, it might spark an interest in them to do more research on it, um, to get more information on it, and then um, see what they can do about it in the future. And then, of course, the last thing in your personal connection is your personal connection to the topic. Uh, so usually the topic that you're excited or passionate about advocating for directly or indirectly affects you personally. And you usually have some personal story or experience to go along with that um, that's interesting or and compelling uh, to the legislator. And so I do want to emphasize that personal experiences and that the unique connection to an issue is just as important as the professional experience that you might have. And uh, that you, as a constituent, are a trusted source based on your personal experiences as well. So how exactly would a legislator website look like when you're looking up who represents you? So this is uh, a screenshot of the Indiana General Assembly website. Um, so like I said, you're going to basically go into the street address section right here. Um, you put in your address, uh, you're going to search and it's going to auto populate with a state map on the right side of the page and it shows a specific district that you live in. And then a list of all your state and federal representatives as well, and their contact info and if you click on their name it'll basically have their email and phone number and their, their office information. So I just want to show how the website looks and how you can go in and put any address 
um, in Indiana and find out more information about these legislators and which districts that they represent. Okay, so next I wanna talk about local advocacy and how you can get involved in that. Okay, so volunteering. Volunteering is one of the best and easiest ways to do local advocacy. Um, I wanna highlight it because I think it's uh, one that most people don't fully know is uh, actually a type of advocacy, which it absolutely is. Volunteering is 100% a type of advocacy. Um, if you spend that time volunteering for the efforts that you're passionate about, then that is a type of advocacy work. By donating your time and effort to organizations such as ours or Shirley Hines or uh, Nature Conservancy in your community, you're proactively volunteering for issues that you believe in. Um, so I just wanted to remind you that volunteering is absolutely a type of advocacy that you might already be doing today. So next I wanna talk about social media advocacy. Um, so this is somewhat of a newer type of advocacy. Um, so many uh, times you don't even need to look too far to do effective advocacy. Um, you could just do it on your phone or your computer. Um, there are many smart and innovative ways to do a post on social media, um, on our social media platform and spark a new way of thinking about an issue. In addition, social media is an excellent way to meet, reach a lot of people, millions and millions of people sometimes on a platform that can both be used to inform and entertain at the same time. Um, so social media is also a great way to attract younger audiences to your cause or your issue. And it might encourage others in your community to do something similar um, to what you are doing in their own community. Uh, these are some great examples that our community engagement coordinator M has made for us, uh, for our organization. And uh, this is something that you can do yourself on your own social media pages. So I'm just going to pause here for a little bit and just let everybody read these. So, um, you know, she did uh, one of the Barker Seasonal Forum, which is a new uh, program that we're doing um, quarterly. Um, and then she made an amazing one on the, the new Monarch uh, Act. And then, of course, the recycling project that um, she is still working on. So, you know, there are many different ways to to get involved. But this, this is just some examples of how you can get involved in social media advocacy. All right, so um, the other way to get your voice out is through informative video. So it allows you to put your unique spin uh, to your own uh, topic and make sure that your voice reaches a larger audience. So if you decide to make a video, just make sure that the audience understands your personal connection to the topic. It's always important. Um, and then uh, making sure your personal connection with your audience allows for others to understand both who you are personally and why they should listen to you and what you were saying and then possibly get involved as well. Like, why should they get involved or do something about this? Um, there's always a possibility of your personal experience uh, being similar to theirs and for it to spark interest in them because of that connection, that personal connection, as I said. So another type of local advocacy that you might want to do um, and is to talk to others in your community is canvassing. Um, it's a way more personal approach that you might want to do where you you know go door to door and you use your voice to convince voters to come and vote for a specific candidate or a specific issue and to get others to be interested in your topic or issue. So it can be a foundation to build a grassroots team that can possibly possibly later start to do more lobbying or advocacy efforts. Uh, canvassing is also a great way to give more clarity or inform others of the topic in general. And you can act as a type of political resource about the current candidates. Um, do keep in mind, however, that it could also be a great way to canvas um, for a specific bill being discussed as well. Um, so it's it's quite broad and it also gives that personal kind of one-on-one -on -one approach um, when you're going toward door to door. So if this is something that you want to do, this is a great way to, to uh, get involved. So now I want to talk about how individual advocates have helped us at Save the Dunes. So when we go lobbying um, and meet our representatives, we do so as, um, as our mission statements uh, claims is to protect and advocate for the Indiana Dunes, Lake Michigan, and the surrounding areas for the health and vitality for the environment and the individuals who live work and recreate in the Northwest Indiana region. So we in many ways also represent you and other individuals in our region um, and work to make the region of Northwest Indiana a better place to live for all of us. So our collaboration with other environmental groups on the same advocacy efforts uh, makes all of our voices and initiatives stronger as a whole. So really working together in teamwork is such a huge part of advocacy. 
So I want to talk about a specific example um, from our organization of how individual advocates help us do our work. So our organization is focused specifically a lot on water policy issues, um, specifically water pollution prevention. So in the previous year, some of our industries in our region have had several non-compliance discharge spills or pollution events which have sparked a really big concern from the public um, regarding, you know, as an after uh, effect from these events. So during these times, some of our members would express concerns and contact our organization or other nonprofit organizations in our area about uh, these spills. And throughout this time, we understood a lack of transparent and communicated communicative relationship between the industries and the regulatory bodies, such as, you know, Indiana Department of Environmental Management um, and the public that we could, our, as Save the Dunes, we could help um, and play a role in making better. So kind of increasing that communication and that transparency is something that we we strive to, to work for. And so through that experience and understanding of public health concerns in our region, we created the Water Pollution Prevention Roundtable, where we're able to better communicate and share information with other environmental nonprofits um, and also later regulatory bodies, such as ITEM, to try and prevent these types of events from occurring in the future. So we understood the need to create these public fact sheets that we're going to uh, launch later, I think probably 2024, um, regarding some of the various uh, important chemicals that were discharged from the shoreline industries in our area. So I just wanted to highlight a really specific example of how individual advocate voices are vital to the work that we do at Save the Dunes. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how coalitions and collaborations could help you do your own advocacy work. So one of the best exa uh, examples um, of an environmental coalition in our area is the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, or HOW for short. So they're a coalition that focuses specifically on water policy issues and keeping our Great Lakes clean and less polluted um, and includes representatives from all of the Great Lakes states. So the key reason how it works so well is because of their collaborative efforts across all of the Great Lakes states, uh, the entire Great Lakes region, where they focus on working strategically, collaboratively, and compassionately for all of the Great Lakes and the residents who live there. Um, another big issue they focus on is equity and justice. So making sure that any actions that they take to restore clean water and healthy ecosystems must reverse environmental injustices and prevent any future ones from happening. Um, a huge part of that is making sure that diverse voices are heard and that they're definitely brought to the table when these water policy discussions um, or decisions are being made um, and making sure that these diff uh, different voices or diverse voices are accepted and are not ignored. Um, the last big issue I wanted to highlight is their dedication to democracy and public engagement. And they emphasize that environmental policies and practices are always stronger um, they're more effective and more equitable when the public is participating in the decision making and that they have a say in the laws being discussed. So how, always having public opinion is better. Um, the public is a very important resource to understand how environmental policies and practices in place can be improved and changed for the better. And they also are focused on the collective public voice to do that. So I encourage you to please consider visiting their website um, and joining the coalition if environmental advocacy, um, specifically water policy issues, is something that you are passionate about. Um, and if you want to get more information um, about how you can get involved in that, uh, please do uh, consider visiting their website. So one of the most important programs that Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition runs is Great Lakes Day Lobbying. Um, so where they have several state specific teams meet with their federal representatives and senators to discuss federal water policy issues in the Great Lakes region. So for example, during Great Lakes Day 2023, our Indiana team met with uh, both of our senators, staffers um, from Mike Braun and Todd Young and Congressman Ravan and Yakum directly. So I just want to talk about some examples of policy priorities that we discussed last year with them in person. Um, and that's going to be very similar to what we're probably going to discuss in 2024. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. So we advocated for funding the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative at $425 million, um, funding the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration at no less than $8 million. Um, We also asked to fully fund key water infrastructure programs, including the state revolving funds. 
Uh, we asked to double the farm bill conservation bill. Um, so funding it no less than 12 billion that ensures that conservation programs are fully funded and staffed to provide training, you know, the technical assistance, monitoring and support for implementation and sustainable uh, conservation. Is. So um, these are probably going to be quite similar to what the policy priorities that we will discuss in D.C. for 2024 will be. But um, for instance, we might talk about, let's say, wetlands or things like that. But I just want to give some specific examples if um, for people who might be interested in joining us uh, during Great Lakes Day um, so that they have an idea of uh, the different uh, water policies that are uh, discussed. So without further ado, I'm going to officially ask um, and present the idea that we want somebody um, like you to join us next year uh, during our Great Lakes Day. Um, so in 2024, in the beginning of March, we are going to go to DC and lobby and meet with our uh, federal representatives. And we would love one of you to join us. Uh, please join us and consider applying for a spot on our advocacy team next year. Um, we're looking for an advocate that's interested in speaking out on environmental issues. It's a great way to speak about the issues that you care about with your representatives and their staffers in person um, and also telling them your own personal story. So connecting uh, your experiences to the federal water policy issues that matter the most to you. Um, and so when we go to DC uh, during Great Lakes Day, we're going to discuss federal water issues around the Great Lakes region. And we're going to prioritize meeting with the congressional Great Lakes leaders that represent the shoreline communities in Northwest Indiana. So that's going to be specifically districts one through two, um, which include Lake Porter and LaPorte counties, and both of our federal senators, um, of course, that represent the entire state. Um, so I just wanted to show a visual of this is our district map, our congressional district map of Indiana. So we're going to focus really on this, this section right here, District 1. So when we go to D.C. during Great Lakes Day, um, we are going to discuss federal water issues around the Great Lakes region and prioritize meeting with the congressional Great Lakes leaders that represent the shoreline communities. Um, and... That require um, the. I just wanted to talk about the requirements now for somebody who wants to possibly join us on our team. So the requirements will be that you have to live and work in Northwest Indiana, um, feeling, and you have to feel comfortable enough to talk to congressional leaders and or staff members about your stories and one of the policy priorities. So it can be very intimidating and you know kind of scary to talk to the congressional leaders directly or their staffers. Um, I know I was very nervous the first time I did it, but I can say, you know, with firsthand experience that our Indiana offices are very, very nice and they always have really kind staffers and our representatives are really nice and excited to speak to their constituents and love when we speak from the heart and we make that really personal connection or that personal story um, about the water policies that we care about. They really, really love um, our meetings and, and hearing what we what we think and our opinions. So um, making that personal connection is always equally, if not more important than highlighting the technical policy issues as a genuine uh, story from a lobbyist is always more inspiring and more likely to uh, make sure that their staff or congressional leader remembers you remembers your group and then also remembers your issues. Um, it's always important to stay concise though and stay on topic as our meetings are usually more than like not more than half an hour, uh, usually probably less than half an hour. And uh, each person has about five minutes uh, to tell their own personal story. Uh, so the person must be able and have a flexible schedule during the first week of March uh, 2024, since that's when the entire team is going to travel to DC in March. Um, and then meet with our representatives. And last but not least, of course, we're looking for somebody who has that passion, as I was talking about, somebody who has passion for the Great Lakes and is really excited about protecting the Great Lakes. Um, and so uh, talking about the specifics uh, time in March, so we don't have the the dates yet, but it will for sure be the first week of March. So, uh, you know, stay tuned uh, for more information about that. We will for sure post um, when we have those specific dates. So I just want to go into like, how do we actually prepare for these lobby meetings? Um, so as we mentioned before, each member of the lobby team creates their stories for the meetings that last about, you know, five minutes. Um, so these stories are going to focus on one policy priority. So one each member of the team usually picks one of these policy priorities. 
and how that pol and you're going to talk about how that policy priority affects you personally and why the congressional leader or staffer should be in support of that policy as well. So, for example, I will give an example of like what my overall story was last year. Um, and depending on who we were meeting with, but my general script went something like this. So I would say like, hello, my name is Harshini. I'm the advocacy coordinator for Save the Dunes. I'm from Michigan City, Indiana. I've had the privilege for working at Save the Dunes and living in Northwest Indiana for several months. And I'm in close proximity to the national park um, and have an opportunity to visit and experience the amazing biodiversity and habitats here. Um, and then as my role as advocacy coordinator, I have the privilege to focus on water pollution prevention work. So working closely with our regulatory bodies, such as Indiana Department of Environmental Management, community groups, et cetera, and other nonprofits, I've had a firsthand look at the need for an increased regulation when it comes to clean water protections. So the Lake Michigan watershed is much more than the lake. It's made up of thousands of rivers and streams and other waterways that eventually drain into Lake Michigan. Um, so it's critical that we not only protect Lake Michigan, but also the waterways and other tributaries that safeguard our downstream communities for the environment. And we ask not, not only for your support for the changes to the Clean Water Act, but specifically the change or reversal back to the original definition of waters of the U.S. So that was pretty much my my uh, story. It was quite short. Um, you know, you're always going to change it up just depending on who you're talking to. But um, it's it's quite short and and concise. Um, kind of gets to the point and then talks about who you are and where you're from and why this matters to you. And so I just wanted to stop and show the policy priorities from last year um, and then kind of give an idea of how how the you know policy parties might affect you and if these are things that you would care about, how you might talk about them, right? And so um, Healing Our Waters, Great Lakes Correlation does a really good job of kind of highlighting specific things that you might want to talk about um, to your legislator in the meeting. Um, so for instance, if you want to talk about, you know, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, you might want to say like, hey, we want you to fund it no less than 425 million, um, you know, and they kind of give you some really good bullet points to to go into the meeting with. So we really, really help you and, and we do collaborate with our Indiana team uh, quite a lot to make sure that your story is great and, uh, you know, concise and, and that you're um, excited and, and ready for these meetings as well. Okay, so like I said, we want you to be a part of the team. So we're going to formally ask for any interested people now to apply uh, through the Great Lakes Day application and be a part of our team. So you know, I just want to say that we have so much fun every year. It's it's so rewarding to be able to talk about the issues and go to DC and say, you know, how um, important it is to you and to your community and also do it with a, an amazing, amazing team in Indiana. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, we hope that you consider applying. And just as FYI, the space is quite limited. Um, so if you apply, um, you are not guaranteed a spot, unfortunately, as our lobby teams are quite small. Um, as you can see in the picture, you know, there's only like usually five or six of us. Um, and but we really do uh, want uh, a huge applicant pool. So please do do apply. We encourage everyone who is interested to please get involved. So last but not least, I really want to emphasize the importance of teamwork and advocacy work again. Um, Picture Tour is our amazing team at Save the Dunes. I'm very, very fortunate to work um, with them. And without their support and experiences, I would not be able to do my advocacy work effectively. Um, as an individual advocate, it's important to keep in mind that teamwork makes a difference and makes both you and your movement stronger. Um, regardless of whatever issue that you're excited about. So be sure to see if there's other opportunities in your community to work with a team of advocates to strengthen your own voice. And that is it. So I want to just say thank you so much um, for everyone tuning in, uh, either live or after, uh, to talk about advocacy and learning how you can be an advocate as well. If you have any uh, other questions or concerns about advocacy efforts, feel free um, to reach out to me. Um, ch uh, check out our, our uh, newish website, uh, follow our Facebook, Instagram, check out our YouTube for more information about what we are currently doing in our region. Um, and once again, if you happen to have the means to please consider donating to us on Giving Tuesday to support our efforts. Um, and please do uh, consider joining our team during Great Lakes Day and filling out that application. So at this time, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat um, and we'll read them out and I would be happy to answer them. Uh, we can either leave them in the chat or we can, un we can unmute and...
go ahead and open up the chat if you have a question. I have shared the um, Google survey that will allow you guys to um, apply to go to Washington, D.C. So feel free to find that in the chat. And I will also send it in an email to all the attendants today in the Zoom. Um, we didn't have any questions on Facebook, so we're all good there. I have, I have a question if nobody else does. Yeah, of course, Susan, go ahead. So um, I'm, I'm working on my January column for the Northwest Indiana Times, and it's going to focus on all these new local advocacy, um, sustainable um, community groups, you know, forming in these, in the, you know, Porter and Munster and Highland and all these different communities. And um, it's not just going to focus on this. It's, it's going to focus on our strong history of environmental advocacy, but it's also going to provide some advice to them. Um, and so if there's one thing you'd want to tell some of these local groups forming to be, you know, one piece of advice you'd give them to be successful, what, what would it be? Yeah, um, I, I would love to hear what Em says, but I'll, I'll just answer first. Um, 100% teamwork, what we just said at the very end. Um, getting people who also care about you involved and making a very good, concise group that, you know, um, kind of divvies up uh, different tasks is fantastic. So, you know, we talked about research, right? We talked about making your personal story, making that personal connection to that issue. That's the first place it starts. And then also making sure that you find other advocates in your local community, or maybe, you know, even online virtually or in person and and talking about how, how you can make a difference is the best way to go. And as you know, Susan, I mean, you know, these sustainable uh, uh, groups or, you know, I'm just thinking of the Michigan City Sustainability Commission, you know, they, yeah. they're all just advocates who care about the same thing. And then they found each other and said, let's do this together. Um, because teamwork really does make the dream work. I could not do what I do without M, without Katie, without Betsy, Lisa, and Amber, for sure. So teamwork. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I would probably say um, a little bit of uh, obscure confidence in what you're doing. Like know that what you're doing, it will make an impact regardless of if you start small or start large. I think like with our recycling program, we're seeing a lot of people like want to get involved and want to, you know, help out. And I think once those groups get started, more and more people will just be willing to join in, share their voice, share what they can do, because that's part of the teamwork aspect of it as well. So yeah, dream big, do, you know, don't think that the little small things that you're doing aren't making an impact because they really are. Yeah. Can you talk more about the recycling program? Oh, sure. So we started a recycling project in September of this year, um, collecting clean and dry plastic films and plastic bags. And if we um, collect a thousand pounds in the 12 month cycle of the um, project, we'll receive a recycled plastic bench, which will be on um the Save the Dunes property. And it's through a company called Trex. They do, um, yeah, environmentally friendly uh, recycled plastic, like uh, decking and for outdoor furniture. So yeah, we're working with them. So we are collecting the plastic bags and films um, at the Barker House. So if you want to drop off or make a donation at the Barker House, you can contact me. I can leave my email in the chat here. We can organize a time. Um, if not, you can also drop off at Shirley Hines Meadowbrook office in Velpo. They've got a collection bin there. And then the Ellen Firm Gallery on route 12 in beverly shores they've got a collection bin too yeah i just want to i screen shared the um m's uh, social post about that so if you can see the collection locations a little bit more about their recycling project and tell me if i'm wrong but i believe it's to um honor jeanette Nagu, yes. who was the epitome of of advocacy so yeah, just ties in beautifully with everything you've just said or she yeah she was uh, <laughs> yeah Jeanette Michigan was, uh, City <laughs> right yeah it's amazing like our our 
Michigan City really has a lot going for it. You know, we, we've had so many amazing advocates through the years, um, specifically from Michigan City or, you know, Northwest Indiana in general. Um, and it's it's amazing. And it's always, you know, it's such an amazing group of women advocates, which is also such a great thing to see. You don't usually see that, especially, you know, back then, just such amazing work. Um, it's it's so inspiring. It really helps us do what we do and, and have our passion as well at Save the Dunes. Um, just to know that our founder and, you know, the Save the Dudes Council before us um, was so passionate about this work. Um, it, it really helps us kind of get excited and, and passionate about what we're doing today. Just one other little thing I wanted to mention tied to the Nagus. I mean, it, it just talks about, again, about advocacy and that George Nagu advocated for Strebel Pond. Okay. And, um, and, and now you have these like two limpkins showing up there, these very rare birds you know, that are showing up there. And there's also been other ones. I mean, it's just, it's an out, outstanding um, impact that they made on advocacy in Michigan City. So incredible. Thank you for sharing that history with us, Susan. Yeah, absolutely, Susan. Thank you so much. I love hearing about the history of, of Michigan City and Northwest Indiana because it, it really shows you like how much of the advocacy work is still being done today, but also where it started before and, and how we're just continuing that 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 passion and that excitement, that effort. Any other questions, comments, concerns? We, we really look forward to y'all applying and um, so please submit those documents whenever you get a chance. We'll be going over them over the next month or so. I think we're going to aim in the new year once how conference sets those dates and we set our dates of when we're going to be there and then we'll be reaching out to applicants. So thank you again for everybody in attendance. Um, two other small Save the Dunes updates. Um, we do have our upcoming membership meeting. So if you are a Save the Dunes member uh, currently, we do have our member our annual member meeting and holiday celebration on December 6th at the Barker House. So feel free to come by. There's some RSVPs out for that if um, in the newsletter. And we'll also be sending out another newsletter on the first of the month that has a little bit more details about it. And then we also have a sustainable gift wrapping workshop coming up next month that'll focus on plastic free um, gift wrapping using natural materials, forged materials, um, and uh, upcycled materials. Those tickets are available as well on our website. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight and take care. I hope everyone had a good long weekend. Thank you guys. Bye. Right. Bye.